Thank you very much indeed for that warm welcome. It's an amazing privilege to stand here and look at you all in this amazing venue. When I, when I look around, I think I'm slightly overwhelmed by the, the journey I made to get here. Because I don't mean the journey, you know, on the M25 and the M40, the M6, but the journey to actually get to be somewhere and be someone who, who people are prepared to listen to. It's just been quite amazing when I look at you all. So I'm, a good book can change the way you think about life. And I know that without books, I wouldn't be here now, that's for sure. I went to prison in 1984 for life. I was sentenced to life imprisonment. I, I was convicted of terrible crimes, which uh, I can never make amends for. And when I went into jail, I had had such a problematic and dysfunctional existence before prison. I had a very painful life. It was painful for me, but more importantly, it was, it was painful for other people because of me. And I couldn't really figure out why that was. I was in a life that I hated. I had no respect for myself. I had no sense of being valuable or worth anything. And how, how then was I ever going to think that other people were valuable or had worth? I, 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 my whole existence from a very young age had been directionless, without purpose, and more problematic as the years went by. I was stuck in this place and I didn't know how to get out of it. I lived on the streets. I used to see nice people like you going to conferences and getting on buses and driving their cars and going to work and mixing with their friends. And you think, how do you get to be a person like that? How do, how do you join? How do you be a part of a community where you belong and you're connected and you're friends and, and people care about you? How do, how do you become that, you know? And I, I couldn't see how you cross the road and join that sort of a, an existence. My early life, I'm not going to make any excuses. There's no, no excuses for crime. There's no excuses for my criminal behavior in the past, and I'm not here to make any now. But my early life was blighted by uh, sort of violence and alcohol, domestic abuse, all those things that people who end up in prison, the majority of them, are quite familiar with. And I went into jail in 84 without any sort of sense that I could ever be anything more than what I was, a base criminal failure. I had no hope, I had no aspirations, I had no ambitions. You know, where do you get those things from? Are they intrinsic? No, you need encouragement, you need support. You need people around you who value you, tell you, you know, you can do this, you can manage this, you can overcome that. You need champions around you. When you're growing up, you know, we all need champions. And I'm in jail. The judge sentenced me at the Old Bailey. And I have to tell you, it was a great relief when I uh, walked down those steep wooden stairs. I, I was reminded of those wooden stairs in the civic court today when I looked over the dock and I saw these stairs. Oh, my God. It's exactly like that at the Old Bailey. And I walked down there and a great sense of relief fell from my shoulders that I did not have to go back out into that world again because I, I didn't fit in out there. I had no place out there. I had no position out there. I had no purpose out there. I was glad it was over. Had the death penalty been on the statute books when I was sentenced, I would have received it. And I wouldn't have minded. I'll tell you that now from the heart. I would not have minded. In the newspaper reports, after my conviction, I, I'm sure that people outside who read it, would, they wouldn't have cared if I lived or died in there. And the fact is, I didn't care either. They, they took me to Wandsworth Prison. I was a high security prisoner. They locked me in a cell where, I, where I, was, I, I stayed for 23 hours a day. Do you know we still have prisoners in, those, in cells like that locked up for 23 hours a day now, today, as we're here enjoying this sunshine? Which does them no good and does us, us no good, believe me. But I was locked in there. Doors were open just for moments at a time to collect food and collect water for a wash. I had a, in my cell, I had a table, a chair, 
a bucket for my toilet, half an old sponge pillow. And that was my lot. And that's, believe me, I'm not complaining. I deserved all that was coming to me. I didn't realize when I went in there that I had the edge on so many of my fellow prisoners because I could read. I wasn't educated. I was ill-educated, but I could read. I didn't realize how many people in prison can't read or write, really struggle with that. I was allowed six books a week from the prison library. I, didn't, I wasn't very judicious in my reading choices. My dad used to read westerns, so I started to read westerns. Edge the Loner, Louis L'Amour. You know, I read these crazy escapist western books and, and wondered about myself, locked up in that cell. How did I become... How has this happened? Was I born bad? I didn't think I had been because I had no will to go out on that landing and hurt more people. I was in a gloomy, dark place, but I'd been stopped in my tracks and I could think for the first time in my life I was fed. It wasn't the most appealing food, but I was fed. I had a bed, I had clothing, my blue convict shirt, my old denims and my well-worn shoes. And um, I could think, I had time to think and try to figure out and I started to become quite fascinated by how any of us become who we become. It's a complicated process, that. And, and I read my Westerns. And I went, to the, I went to the library every Saturday morning where oh, there's six at a time they took us to pick our six books. And people who love libraries and love books like I do, you know, an, an hour is not a great deal of time in a library. But I grabbed my books and they, those books had to last me all week in that cell. And then something extraordinary happened. A friend of mine, a soldier in South America, he sent me a book. And he wrote inside this book, you never know where a good book might take you. And this is that book. This is not the one he sent me. I actually donated that, my, my personal copy that I had for 29 years. I donated it to a charity called Give a Book last year who are they're, they're creating reading rooms. They're enhancing library facilities in prisons. So I donated my book that I had for 29 years. But I still keep this book on my desk today. I got a copy because it's, it's, uh, it's like a little, it's still a token of hope. This book came through the, the post and Prisoners of Honor, The Dreyfus Affair, David L. Lewis. I'd never heard of this before, but prisoners, it appealed to me because something about prisoners, honor, that was embarrassing because I was no prisoner of honor. Never heard of the author. But I started to read the book, and it was the most engrossing, compelling narrative that I'd ever read about Alfred Dreyfus, the, the Jewish captain. Most of you, I, I know, you will know who he was. In prison for life in 1896 for crimes that he didn't commit. He was accused of being a spy. It, it was all about anti-Semitism. He, he, he was a young Jewish captain, but he was a very fine man. Now, all my life, I'd lived without courage, without integrity, without values, but mostly without courage. And I read about this man, Alfred Dreyfus, whose courage was fantastical. He survived five years on this little rocky out outcrop off the French Guiana, Guiana coast called Devil's Island. They built a small prison for him, a tiny hut, not much bigger than my prison cell. And they built it for him, and, and it's on a little uh, rocky outcrop. And I read about his story. And he was such a magnanimous, ma magnanimous man. He, he, when he was sure that he was dying, he wrote to his wife and he said, I leave my children to France. And France had destroyed him. France had conspired the highest echelons in French society, in French military circles, had conspired a conspiracy of silence. They knew he was innocent. But to protect, they were the prisoners of honor. To protect their honor, they were happy for this fine, courageous man of integrity to rot in this, the, the edge of the world, this little prison. And I read about this man, and I thought, God, you know, I, what it must be like to have that sort of courage and that sort of truth and that sort of honesty. And in prison, you live inside your head. You live in dreams and fantasies. And I had this really wild fantasy, ridiculous fantasy, that if I ever got out of prison alive, one day I'd like to go to Dreyfus's island prison 
I'd let her go in there and look out the, through the bars of his little window and hold these bars and wish for some of his courage and some of his integrity. What a ridiculous fantasy that was. <laughs> so, you know, so outlandish. I was a robust character. I'd had a robust life. I managed the, the vagaries of Wandsworth Prison. Those, those doors were open just brief moments at a time. And uh, there was always somebody getting bashed in the recess. Prison officers took their time to rescue victims. Back behind the door, I read my book. I, read, I must have read that book half a dozen times. I was in that prison that year, a year and a month. My six books, my thinking. But I'd been shown a path by that book because suddenly I had an ambition not to get out of jail and be a journalist, but to try and find a decent way to live. That was my one ambition. Find a decent way to live. Try and adopt values that of integrity, and courage, and truth, and goodness. And I had these crazy thoughts. Spent that year, my first Christmas in Wandsworth Prison, the man in the cell above mine hanged himself. It was a blessing to get out of that jail. I was transferred to my first long-term high-security prison. Here, this next place, we weren't locked up in our cells all day. Maybe 14 hours, 15 hours a day we were locked up, and that included the nighttime times, periods. We had, there were workshops, went to work in the day, came back to the cells for our food, back out to the workshops in the afternoon. A little bit of association in the evening. But I saw possibilities in this prison because there was a library. There was a chapel. There was an education department. There was a gymnasium. There was an exercise yard I could use every day in Wandsworth. If the weather, if the weather was inclement, we got no exercise. I didn't know what inclement weather. Inc inclement weather, I, I knew it meant no exercise, but what the hell did inclement mean? And uh, well, I found out it meant, you know, windy or rain. Officers don't like going out in that weather, so you stay in. And I, I saw, but in this other jail, I could go and exercise every day. I could go and do a bit of jogging and walk and think. And there were, I saw possibilities. And I, then I met a psychologist whose job was really to assess the dangerousness of people like me. On my wing, there were about 85 people serving life imprisonment. You know, there were terrorists, child abductors, serial rapists, serial killers, all the dregs of society. Uh, I was one of that community on that wing. There was barely a spoon of hope between us. And this psychologist, she called us up for sessions because her, her job was to find out what, how would you become such a damaging, harmful individual? What were your risks? How can they be resolved, you know? It was, this was her job. And she's a very, a very quaint, not, not old lady, but getting on a bit. She was almost retiring when I met her. And she, would, she used to walk on that wing. No fear, no judgment. She, her, her, her office was a converted cell. And she'd sit in there, your name would be outside. And it was, people used to shrug when they, you know, try and duck when they saw that you're up for a psycho call up. You know, oh God, you know, my turn. And then you went, and this little lady, she started to talk to me and try and figure out how I'd become what I'd become. Well, I like that because I want to know that too. And over a period of 18 months, she persuaded me I had some value. Now, that was hard going. She persuaded me I was valuable. She said, you're still valuable. I said, well, I can't be still valuable because I wasn't valuable before, but I, I'm, I'm prepared to believe I might have some value left. And she said to me, her name was Joan Branton. And she said, look, You've got to get an education. You have, to, you have to think articulately. That's another word I had to go and look up. I, you know, I didn't own a, a dictionary. For, it took me three years before I owned my own dictionary. But I could always get a dictionary from the prison library to find out what these big words meant. And I, thought, I said, Joan, I'm too thick. I was 30 years old by then. I said, I'm too stupid for education. She, she said, no, we're all born lovable. We're all born with potential. She said, don't say, talk like that. We use words like thick and stupid. You know, you're, you're a valuable human being. You know, it used to make me 
want to cry when she said that to me. And I thought, tentatively, eventually, I thought, well, I'll, I'll try education, just so I can say to Joan, look, I tried it, but I failed. Uh, at least I had a go, and thanks for your help and everything. When I was a little boy, I was in a children's home for a while. I, I lived on the streets for a little while as a kid, started committing crimes, and then they scooped me up and put me in a home. And when I was at the home, we had to go to school, and at school, I was, re I was really good at English. I don't know where that came from, because none of my family were educated, particularly educated. But I was always like the first to get my hand up in the English class for spelling lessons. And um, I loved it when Mrs. Earnshaw, the teacher, used to get me to stand up and read books to the class. One of my favorite books then was Gerald Durrell's My Family and Other Animals. I loved that, that book, and I used to like to read it to my class. And of course, when I sat down, I was a sullen, little, miserable kid. You know, I only sort of came alive in Mrs. Earnshaw's class. When I got back to the home and showed them my report card, and most of the stuff was negative, Irwin has a chip on both shoulders. Irwin is a sullen child. He must learn to communicate. Irwin has a terrible temper. He must learn to control it. I, I used to be such a miserable little sod. But Mrs. Earnshaw, Irwin is a delight to teach. Grade A, tick, comprehension, grade A, you know. But nobody, nobody looked at that. They always looked at the negative stuff. And it became my secret good thing, this being good at English. Well, I left the home at 15, went back to live at my dad's place. He was still a drunken, violent man, abusive to the people he lived with. And I, like, I moved on after a while, and I became a bit like my dad. <sighs> Sadly, I became a bit like him. And when I, you know, I culminated in, in uh, the end, really, for me. I thought it was the end. In fact, it was the beginning. I joined the English class. I thought, I'll try the English class. I was good at that one as a kid. It was still there. Soon in prison, my prison English class, I was the top of the class. Because it's not that hard to be top of the class in English. And I shouldn't really say that in, in, in prison. It's, uh, it's not really hard to be top of the class. But I passed my O-level English exam, got a grade A, couldn't wait to go back and show Joan Branton my certificate. 30 years old, Joan, look at what, you know, like a big kid. She said, I told you, she was not phased. I told you, we all, we all have potential. We're all born lovable. We're all born with hope. And what amazing things to say to people, someone like me. I joined other classes. I did my homework in my cell. Went to the workshops in the day. Went to the gym. Went to the chapel on a Sunday morning. And tried to use that prison as a community. I, I, that's when the first time I saw prison as a valuable community resource. And I thought, this place is as valuable as a hospital or a school. But... Our society doesn't use it. I never thought about society before. I was always on the fringes of society. I didn't see society as something that I belonged with, belonged in. But I, so I joined these other classes, learned geography, and I started to think my big empty head suddenly filled with furniture, filled with light. And uh, I loved learning and, and passing stuff and doing my homework and telling Joan. And then she retired, she moved on. And I really got the education book. But before Joan retired, a moment came when I stopped the education because I started to feel good about myself. For the first time in my life, I started to feel really good about myself. I achieved things. I, I, I worked hard and I achieved things. And I felt good. And I stopped. And, and Joan came to see me in my cell. She said, I understand you've, you've given your books and everything back to the education department. I said, yeah. I said, I... I don't deserve this, John. I can't do this. It was too much, you know, my guilt. Uh, it was exacerbating my sense of, uh, of, uh, of not being worthy. She said, well, you can do that if you want. You have choices in here. People say there are no, no choices in prison, but you have choices. You can get out of bed or stay in bed. You can go to the workshop, don't go to the workshop. You can educate yourself or don't educate yourself. She said, but my advice to you is that you owe it to your victims to do the best you can with the life you've got left. And you've proved that you can achieve things. So you owe it to the people you've harmed, the pain you've caused, to do the best you can. And she left that with me. And I, was, I stayed in that cell for almost a week, you know. I had to cry. I was depressed. I, it was conf you know, I was confused. And I thought, well, she's right. I, I, I should get back on there. And I got back on the education horse. And 
I, it's not about feeling good about myself. It was, to, it was doing the best. Any of us should do the best we can with our lives. And sadly, I'd learned that too late. I started my degree course, and I started to study history and ancient Greece, the classics. I thought, well, try the classics. Why is that the classics? Because I thought all oh, posh, like educated, well-off people know what the classics are. I thought, I'll have, I'll have a look and see what that is. It's, it's just ancient history, you know. Anybody can learn it from a book. Prison libraries, my God thank, God, thank God for there when I needed Thucydides and the history of the Peloponnesian War. Where the hell do I get that from? My prison librarian. And, uh, oh my goodness, there were, there were little oases of peace, optimism, and hope. That was the prison library. It wasn't all fun and education in jail. You know, on a prison landing, people outside think there are rules in a prison, and there are. In the governor's office, there's a big book, and it says, prison rules. But on a prison landing, in a prison wing, amongst prisoners, in a prisoner hierarchy, there are no rules. And you have to really learn how to negotiate that. It's very primitive. Very primitive existence. Dangerous existence. I was in a major riot in Long Larton Prison in 1990, just two days after the Strangeways riot. That was probably one of the most dangerous experiences I had. And when the barricades went up and everybody pulled off the radiators and smashed the telly, and then people think, to kill the man, who, who broke the telly? Who had one telly on the wing? Who smashed the telly? Too late, it's gone. The water was coming, and my next-door neighbor, he was in for killing five people. Let's kill the nonces. You know, nonces are the sex offenders in the prison. I said, Mick, let's not do that tonight. <laughs> let's try and keep calm. He hanged himself six months later, that kid. I got my books into my pillowcase and guarded my door with a big stick. And uh, anyway... It was over. The riot squad came in. There were lots of challenges like that in prison, but I hung on to trying to, trying to, ha trying to develop values of courage and integrity. Alfred Dreyfus. You know. I never forgot that book. Never, ever forgot that book. Never forgot Dreyfus. Never thought about the author. Never really thought about the author. Just thought about the book and the story. And the years passed. Fifteen years into prison. Over the years, I became a sort of a, I became the guy that could write a good letter because I was good at English. People would come to my cell and there was, there was somebody I could help. And that gave me a sense of purpose in that prison community where I, I could actually do something for other people, which I'd never done before prison. I was the guy that could write a good letter. I got involved in writing groups. I edited prison magazines. I tried to encourage other people around me to learn to communicate effectively. We don't need to use batteries in socks to communicate effectively. We can learn through books, and writing, and speaking to each other. Now, I made some enemies in there, but I was determined to use that prison experience positively. Fifteen years in, I got the chance to write for the Guardian newspaper. Unbelievable. Of all the, pre, all the 80 odd thousand people in the prison system, in fact, then there were about 62,000, I got this amazing chance to write for the paper. And so I went to the prison governor. I said, look, the, the Guardian wants me to write a regular column about prison life. No, let me stop you there, he said. No prisoner is allowed to contact the media. I said, governor, no, I don't want to contact the media. I said, and I had to spit it out. I couldn't get it out. It was stuck in my throat. I said, I'm a writer. Oof, I'd never said that to anybody in my whole life before. I'm a writer. And as soon as I said it, I was embarrassed. I thought, I'm a writer. I'm a convict serving life. 99 years. Who would have, who would have think we're trying to kid? And he's, the governor said, I suggest you get another hobby. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, he's right. Why? What am I doing? It's a hobby. I'm a writer, you know. But I was really determined. I mean, some years before that, in another prison, I'd had my first article published in a national newspaper called In the Independent. And on the strength of that, the prison service supported me in uh, getting a grant from the Prisons Education Trust to do a journalist course. And I did this course. And when I, all these years later, when I'm trying to get the Guardian thing, and I told the governor, and I've got my bits and pieces on his desk to show him, look, I really am a writer. And I'm scooping all this stuff up to go back in the folder. And I saw this certificate from the London School of Journalism. And I said, hang on a minute. I said, you supported me doing this. And the governor looked at me and he went, we didn't expect you to do any real journalism. <laughs> I thought, you bastard. How could you do that to me? You know, it was a fantasy. 
But I was actually writing. I was in writing groups. I did love books. I was a communicator. I was developing as a communicator. How could you do that to me? And I felt a bit, so I went to a sulk for a little while. <laughs> so I was talking back in my cell. And I thought, no, come on, I've got to keep going here. This is something, I could just crawl in a hole and rot. And I know that a lot of people in society would have been happier if I had done that. But I'd become very determined. I wanted to achieve as much as I could with that prison experience. And, and wherever it was going to take me, I didn't know. So I petitioned eventually the, the prison's minister. Paul Boatang gave me permission to write a column for The Guardian. I wrote that column from my prison cell for four years, and eventually the, the parole board ordered my release. After 20 years, I'd, by then I was a Guardian columnist. You know, I'd, it was um, unbelievable. I, I went from being a prisoner who could write to being uh, a journalist on a secret underground mission to find out about prisons and to tell the world the reality and truth about our prisons. In fact, before I got out, the, the governor, he, he, uh, the governor said 50 small no's, or one, or one big no or 50 small no's, he said to me when he was trying to tell me I was never going to do this for the Guardian. He, he brought the local deputy mayor into the prison and showing him around his prison. And he brought him to my cell. He said, this is Erwin James, writes for the Guardian. <laughs> and I thought, you're a hypocrite. And, but later, when I spoke to the governor privately, I said, that were you hypocrites. What was all that about? Showing me off to the you know, convict writer. He said, look, I'm amazed you've done what you've done. I'm amazed. I keep expecting the Daily Mail to run front page cover, has the world gone mad? He said, but as a society, we believe in rehabilitation for prisoners, but we're not sure how rehabilitated we want them to come. We want them to be. And, and I thought, how absurd is that? If they're ever going to let me out, they've got to let me out rehabilitated. Don't let me back out there the way I was 20 years ago, or worse, which often that's what we're doing now. We're letting people out worse than they were when they went in. 70% reoffending rate across the board in our country. Why is that? It's not because they're all born bad. They're all monsters and criminals and animals. It's because they've got needs, they've got problematic issues, which if we don't address them and help them to address them while they're in there, they're going to come out and they're going to create more victims. And we're going to be less safe because we don't respect our prisons. I'm sorry if I sound as if I'm pontificating. I don't mean to. But this is the truth of it. Unless we take our prison system seriously and respect it and value it, then we're letting down future victims of people coming out of our prisons. So I got out 20 years to the day. I walked out in the sunny. So I used to think, if I could just live long enough to experience one sunny day out there, I'll keep going. 1,247 people took their own lives while I was serving my 20 years. The year before last, we had more deaths in our prisons, the most deaths in our prisons since records began. You know, a lot of people don't get out there alive. So I was one of the lucky ones. And I got out, and now I'm a feature writer. I'm a columnist. And people want to listen to me. You know, I, went, I, used to live, I used to live rough behind the Guardian building 33 years ago. A drunken, failed tramp. And now I get out of jail and I've got a security pass. And I walk into the Guardian front door and there's free coffee. <laughs> there's a place to sleep if I want, you know. But uh, the years pass, I'm adjusting to life outside. It's problematic, it's difficult, it divides people. Rehabilitation for people like me, I know it's difficult. I walked out those prison gates after 20 years, and I knew that those 20 years didn't make a dent in the debt I owed my victims. So I didn't get out with any sense of triumph, triumph or victory. No, I just got out grateful that I live in a society prepared to give me and people like me a second chance. I'm not going to tell you I deserve that chance, but I'm glad I was giving it. And I'm still, 10 years later, trying to figure it out. But 2005 came, and I suddenly realized that it was the, the centenary of the exoneration of my old friend, Alfred. 2005, he was, he was exonerated in 19, uh, 1905. So I put it to the guy, I said, look, any chance of going over to... French Guiana, Devil's Island, see what's going on over there, the old penal settlement. And my features editor said, yeah, go on. They paid my expenses to go over there, flight, hire cars, 
hotel. It was a rough hotel. It was like the outback out there when I, when I got to Kourou. Uh, it was on the edge of the jungle where the space station is. It was, all, it was so unreal because I could never forget my prison cell in Wandsworth where I first read that book and I first learned about Dreyfus and I was really on my way to go there and go to his prison. And I got to, I, I got managed to get to the, the port, a little basic sort of few, few boats down there, some, some expat Frenchmen running these boats and I, I couldn't get anyone. Nobody would take me to Devil's Island. Saint Ardi, Monsieur, for for Boten. You know, no way can anybody civilians go on Devil's Island. But there are two other islands there called Saint Joseph's and Royal Island. So I got a, a captain to take me on a catamaran to one of the adjoining islands, and I just mooched about there for a while. And then, and then somebody I was speaking to at a bar put me in touch with some passing fishermen, native fishermen from Suriname. They had a big dugout canoe across open ocean. On the, in this dugout canoe doing their fishing. And they said, they'll, they'll take you across for 100 euros. So that's what I did. I joined these guys, and um, they took me across to Devil's Island on this dugout canoe. And my heart was pounding. I thought, how the hell? There's no jetty. It's wild, swirling water all around. There's sharks everywhere. And I got close to the water, and one of the, the captains said, jump. So I'm looking for this, uh, somewhere I can jump to. And I just saw this flat rock and I jumped off the boat into this rotting coconuts and pan-sized spiders. It was amazing to get on there. And I ran through this jungle enclosure. I knew where the hell I was going. And I came out in this clearing after about a minute. I came into this open clearing and there was Dreyfus's prison. And I stopped and I walked up to this place and there's, a, there's an iron bar gate and it was hanging open. So I walked in, it was really cool inside, very tropical. And this, these islands are very tropical and very humid and hot. And I walked into this little prison and I got my hands on his bars in that window. And I looked through those bars where he looked for those five years. Oh gosh, that was one journey from that prison cell in Wandsworth to get into his prison and stand in his shoes and try and feel some empathy for him. And I was there for about half an hour in the island. I had a little mooch about. The, 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 I only paid the guys half the money, the, the boat people. So, so they, I went, I raced back, they, they were still there, they took me back. And <laughs> thankfully, I, I, gave them, I gave them a bonus. <laughs> and uh, came back, wrote the story and moved on. And it's been up and down, but I'm not gonna to lie to you, it's been a challenge to adjust to normal life after 20 years in jail and 27 years of problematic dysfunction. But last Christmas, I started to think about the author of this book. Who wrote this book? Well, the guy that wrote it is a guy called David Levering Lewis. And he's a Pulitzer Prize winning author, amazing guy. And I thought, well, I don't know if he's still alive. This book was written in the 70s. I read it in 85, 10 years after it's been published. We're now, you know, all these years later. Is he still alive, this guy? Well, you Google now, internet. So I, I Googled, found an email address, and I emailed him. And I told him of my story of being in that prison cell and getting hold of his book and what it inspired me to do and not only that, that I managed to do it. I managed to fulfill the most outrageous fantasy from that prison cell, thanks to his book. And I thanked him. I said, I've, I'm still finding my way as a civilized citizen. I said, but I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much. Well, he wrote back to me. And I want to read what he said. <laughs> Dear Mr. James, yours is the first verifiable evidence I think I've received that one of my books ever did anybody much good. <laughs> Be assured that your special appreciation of Prisoners of Honor will stay with me forever. <sighs> forever. That book was my favorite, he says. 
I envy your satisfaction. Sense of closure, it must have been, of setting foot on Devil's Island. I thought of doing so, but then thought rather better of the challenge. <laughs> Let me thank you again for taking the time to send your out of the blue memory of what my book did for you. It is surely one of the most arresting messages of the Christmas season I expect to receive. I hope you'll, you find your holiday season similarly uplifting. Well, I had a little cry after I got that letter. I thought, God, you know, it's, I still can't make amends for what I did, what I was involved in. I had a co accused, there were two of us involved in my crimes. He got out of prison, he served 30 years, he got out last year. However many years we do in prison, I, I can't change the past. Nothing I wouldn't do if I could, if I, if I could go back. I'd give up every single good thing I have in my life if I could just change the past. But none of us can. We have to do the best that we can with our lives, whoever we are. The best I could do was, was find the freedom to be who I should have been. That was the best I could do. And I know you all know this. But a good book can change the way you think about life. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.